Hello, everyone. So thank Hello. you, everyone, for being here today to speak about a very exciting topic. And you surprising words. What does this mean? What are we going to hear today? First, is there a war? Are there too many streaming video services? Is the role of telcos dead? We don't need them anymore. Let me show you three slides, three data points to put everything in context. In this region, I showed this on Monday, pay TV revenues are almost triple all the revenues coming from streaming video. So all the people here in this panel, plus more telcos, more pay TV operators in the region, generate almost 8 billion euros in, uh, dollars in revenues. All the Netflixes, Sky Showtimes, uh, Esbot players in the region generate 2.5. So the power is in your hands. <laughs> and it will be in 2027 as well. So you are not dead, you are very alive. Good news. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Second good news. This is brand new data. We haven't shown this data in any slide, in any presentation event before. We analyze how many subscribers Netflix, Sky Showtime get directly for going solo and how many when they partner with companies like yours. 25% of all the global subscriptions come from partnerships. Again, super relevant to partner with you. <coughs> and this shows that in 2027 and going forward, all the majority of the subscriptions will come in this way, through a partnership, not directly to the consumer. And in Eastern Europe, this is more important than in Western Europe. Here in this region, if you are a streamer and you, they are not friends with you, they are lost. They need you. Let's see if you agree or not. With this note, let's start this amazing panel. <laughs> so I have with me fantastic people. We have next to me Anna Lerenerova, head of content, IPTV, O2, TV Sport, O2, Czech Republic. Hello. Then we have Peter Basson, Head of TV Content Europe at Deutsche Telekom. Hello. Hello. And then we have Bill Bidebel. Very good. <laughs> VP Platform of Content Services at M7 Group. But although many people are familiar with you, do you want to explain a bit your role and what you do in the TV space at your company? Starting with you, Anna. Yeah, sure, because I was explaining it today or yesterday, so I think it's, it's useful. So, uh, uh, O2 Czech Republic uh, is a strong IPTV player, uh, belongs to the PPF group. And the PPF group is the strong investment company acquiring telcos across the Serbia, Bulgaria, Hungary, and also we were running business in Slovakia. And because the IPTV in Czech was so strong and the other telcos uh, also needed to, to support the TV propositions and they launched the, the, its own uh, TV, TV product, it was obvious that that needs some, let's say, guidance, knowledge, market intelligence, which was in-house. Uh, in so we created Content Hub, Group Content Hub, under the umbrella of PPF Group. And we are serving these, uh, these uh, uh, Yatels, uh, uh, Telco, uh, uh, IPTV providers with the content, not only with the, with the uh, rep channels like Discovery, etc., and the others, but also with the partnerships, like you mentioned, and also we do for them the whole market in intelligence. We are supporting them with the, with the propositions, etc. And also for Czech, I'm responsible for the exclusive sport rights acquisitions. Fantastic. So this is, this is and we will <laughs> discuss that content strategy in detail. Thank you, Anna. Okay. Peter. Yeah, I'm working for Deutsche Telekom for the European branch of Deutsche Telekom, which means Europe is Europe minus Germany. So the German entity uh, is a own legal entity, has its own business. And we are covering nine European markets with pay TV across the board from Poland, where we just have launched a year ago, up until Greece, about the Balkans, Croatia, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary, and Austria. So nine markets, roughly four point one million subscribers, all in all. And my role is to be in the headquarters in Bonn that I'm doing the overarching TV content strategy. I'm connecting the dots between all these different affiliates. Um, 
I'm supporting on um, on pan-European projects, on negotiations with bigger streaming partners. Um, I'm a kind of an in-house consulting yeah, also yeah. when it comes to, to content. So a wide range of topics, I would say. And I also facilitate the budgeting of the uh, CapEx and OPEX between our headquarters and the different opcos. Fantastic. Bill. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm working in the M7 group um, as VP Content Platform Manager. So I'm uh, helping the content team um, closing deals mostly for linear services and for an important part still through satellite because that's still the, let's say the bread and butter of our pay TV business. Uh, but we also gradually moving into a more hybrid uh, approach where we combine uh, linear TV with uh, asphalt services and uh, streaming platforms. I don't know what we need to say something about M7 and who is... So we're covering nine European markets, so the, the Bandler's countries, German-speaking markets in Central Eastern Europe, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania. Uh, so we've been acquired by Canal Plus Group three years ago. Uh, so this resulted in this uh, yeah, transformation from the, being a linear pay TV provider to a, the more hybrid uh, uh, approach as today. Great. And we'll speak about the journey of your company because you have been acquiring, transforming, lots of changes. So we'll yeah. go back to that. Yeah. But I want to start with the basics. Although telcos are very important, they're also facing challenges. Some countries there is core cutting, in some countries TV is difficult to grow it. Today, Peter, how relevant is TV for a telco like Deutsche Telekom? I would say it's super relevant. Um, of course, we are a telco, meaning that we are not a pay TV operator per se. Yeah? So pay TV itself is important. Pay TV itself is pos positive. It is um, a revenue stream for us. For us, of course, the role is being a kind of a super aggregator, meaning that we want to aggregate all the best content for our customers, giving our customers the choice of a huge content portfolio to choose what they want to have. Um, but as we are a telco, of course, it's one level higher. It is, of course, bundling. So bundling the TV product together with the mobile, the broadband. Uh, so that, that's another very important role. We call this um, a peace of mind home experience. Yeah? So we have everything together in one mm -hmm. place, that you have a super service, super devices, uh, self-care, whatever, whatever, that you have a full experience of connectivity at home. So do you see yourself as an aggregator of content? Or what is Deutsche Telekom take on your own production? as a differentiator in maybe some saturated markets, how important is to have your own production? I think that is a very difficult topic, to be honest. Um, I mean, in general, I think con content production is very nice and it's a super differentiator. It is an icing on the cake of a BTV proposition. Um, we are doing that in Greece. We had yesterday, I think we had uh, Dimitris Mihalakis here on the stage um, explaining that they are doing as an outlier at DT actually, because that is something which is very unique in the DT portfolio, that Cosmo TV is doing own production, own series, own uh, documentaries. Mm -hmm. um, that is to a certain extent because they have done this for quite some time already. They had really time to develop that. I think for us as a telco, it's quite difficult because it requires um, it requires skills to do that. Yeah? You have to have people who are capable of mm -hmm. doing that. You need a lot of people for that, a capacity within your team to do that. And of course, it requires budget. And believe me, budget at a telco for TV content is a very scarce resource. Uh, so we are fighting this wars for budget within the T group every year for, for our opcos. Um, and now doing something on the production side is really even more difficult because if if you take the decision in Q1 to do own production, mm. it is not ready in Q2, and you don't see the effect on your top line in Q3. Yeah, so mm -hmm. this is something which takes a long way. I think Bill is agreeing, like you should look for the activity. That, that's where we are for. I know, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're here to help you. Yes, okay, so Bill, thank you. <laughs> what are you suggesting? He should focus on broadband connectivity, and you will provide the premium content for him. Is this the best? Yeah, 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 sure. That, well, we've been already on a panel two years ago, and that's, that was the kind of advice or the <laughs> agreement that we should work together and yeah. focus and on we what followed we are. It, of course, we followed. yeah, yeah, we did that. We did, and we executed the partnership. So it was uh, it was a very fruitful panel. Yeah. No, but it's it's exactly what Peter says. Uh, telcos they need at least from our perspective, but I think yeah. everybody can agree. Focus more and more on their core business, which is providing great broadband, yeah. fiber, 
5G. It, it, it can work. I mean, it can work. You see Telefonica, movie star, yeah? So if you yes. have a set of markets with the same language, for yeah, example, yeah. yeah, and you yeah. have the right volume yeah. behind that, it can work. But we operate in nine different markets. Yeah. Together with Germany, it's ten markets. Yeah. We have ten different, nine different languages. Yeah. We have uh, so many different cultural oh, we, we as well. We as well. <laughs> yes, but you have, of course, more distribution possibilities than we have. Yeah? Yeah. So if you do just, just for our own, it, it's very yeah. difficult, yeah. I believe. Oh, but the point I want to make is that, um, let's say, we as M7, but now especially with Canal Plus as, uh, let's say, with a mother company, we have a huge experience, uh, huge libraries of content, uh, uh, productions every year, series films, uh, also you very much localized. So this is a kind of, we see ourselves as a provider, service provider on content, premium content, and uh, not just for ourselves, but we believe also we can help the telcos operators. Uh, exactly. So you're saying, why taking the risk for him to invest yeah, in expensive but, but, series but when you can already that, take that risk? There's still a job for you. That, 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 is true for, that is true for expensive series, but I think, as I said, icing on the cake. Yeah. For example, in Slovakia, we have our own kids' channel. It's called Tuki TV. Yeah. And why do you do that? Because all the kids' channels in this world for the Czech and Slovak market are localized in the Czech language. We wanted to have one channel in Slovak language for the kids. So we did our own kids' channel, Tuki TV, which is run yeah. successfully. Really, It's really good. And that is not expensive, but it's yeah. a very nice differentiator. And I believe that if you do something, it has to have a local flavor. That's why we have <coughs> Cosmo T TV history in Greece, focusing on Greek history. We have Tuki TV. So if you do something, it needs Localized. to have a, lo lo a local touch. Okay, however, Bill again. Go how, however, yeah, that's all fine. <laughs> <laughs> but with, with all respect to kids' channels, yes. it will not allow you to win the war or the pricing war. I think <laughs> the cake. I'm going said, to ask the audience the later who do we think that he should just take everything from Bill and forget about <laughs> producing. I will ask you questions, so get ready. But Anna, what did you think about this discussion? In O2, are you just aggregating? You don't want to take risk producing your own originals? or you are also producing your own content because you think it is important to have your own mm. and don't rely on others. What is the view of O2 in Czech Republic and in general? So I think we've already proven that we are ready to take a risk, uh, not only in a content acquisition, but definitely in a production. So now m more I'm focused on, a, on a sports rights because this was the first, let's say, uh, exclusive uh, uh, property we picked up and we start to develop and of course it's not only the sport rights what you have you also need to invest a lot of into the production to really prepare the fantastic product which people and your customers like and this is the reason why they are staying and they are your subscribers so so definitely we see it as a important however Live sport, even from catch-up, it's relevant for certain audience. So you should have, uh, for different target audience, you need to have some other uh, stuffs which attract them. So, so it's profitable to invest in live sports for a telco, when many telcos were saying it didn't yeah. work. What are your views? Life okay. sports. Return, is return of investment is always the, the, like the 100 million question. But uh, I think we've proven that there are some, some ways how... It can be, of course, uh, sustainable. Uh, therefore, I think we also prove that um, I don't think that the customer uh, care too much if some other uh, customers of other players on the market yeah. have access to the same content. So therefore, I think uh, we've proven that we created a very sustainable environment. We are sharing even the exclusive content and then then you can get to the, to the uh, black numbers. So why not? I fully agree with Anna. So I think that um, sports rights, whether you go into exclusivities, it's depending on the market, on the market structure, on the competitive environment a bit. So if you are a run-up in a market and you really want to capture market, yeah, you want to capture uh, growth, then I think it makes sense, maybe. Um, but uh, in saturated markets, I believe that sharing is the right approach if, if, if it's feasible. Yeah. Um, we SDT, we carry own sports currently here in Croatia with the uh, local league, which has um, a, a, a market a competitive uh, touch, of course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, on, and in Greece, but in all the other markets, we are sharing either sharing sports or we are happy with licensing channels who, who have the sports included. And this m moves to you, Bill. Mm -hmm. Consumers are changing. Yes, telcos are important, but a lot of growth comes from streaming. There is a demand from premium content. M7 Group has changed a lot as well through acquisitions from a satellite business to acquiring premium content. Mm -hmm. Explain a bit that journey and what has worked 
and what hasn't worked that well. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, so we originate from a, so, so the traditional uh, pay television uh, business, uh, mostly uh, based on uh, DTH satellite. Uh, so that's how we started, but already yeah, some years ago we, we realized that uh, this is not the way forward uh, with the streamers coming up and, and consumers asking for more, let's say, on-demand opportunities and uh, other ways to view content. Um, so where do you start to prepare, let's say, in a technical sense, with developing like a smart TV app and also to, to develop our own apps for, for watching content uh, on mobile devices. Um, but just uh, an advanced technology was clearly not enough to, uh, to, to stay relevant. So therefore, the, uh, the acquisition by Canal Plus was, was very welcome because this gave us, uh, that's also the beef <laughs> in the burger, to put it like that, great content, um, series, films, uh, use libraries, um, you are very European, which is also, uh, of course, quite nice, because we are in Europe, where the streamers are much more US-oriented in their content acquisition. And, and also, of course, Canal Plus is very strong on acquiring sports rights, uh, especially for the, the, the Premier League, Champions League rights, and so on. So they're very experienced, very skilled, and of course have very good econ economies of skill where we could build upon. So that's... that's, that's that's why we have developed this scheme for, uh, for, the, for the different markets we operate in. So we started in Austria uh, two years ago, and then we closed the partnership with uh, A1 in that case, A1 uh, Telecom Austria, uh, because they were also uh, looking for a better content proposition, mm -hmm. also for asphalt, um, and to have a more premium kind of uh, movie channel. So this was a great opportunity to work together, uh, where we were not competing, and, and to create a partnership, a joint venture. Uh, so we set up this asphalt platform, we developed a, a, a premium movie channel and we were now planning a, a sports channel because we acquired the Champions League rights for uh, Austria and we do this uh, hopefully also in partnership with uh, telco operators. And the same path we um, set out in uh, the Czech Republic and Slovakia market, which is for us one of the, one of the biggest markets, where we also created uh, an asphalt platform where we launched uh, um, a sports channel around the Premier League rights and um, also a uh, movie channel, same scheme, under the Canal Plus brand. Mm -hmm. um, and we closed a partnership with, uh, in this case, Deutsche Telekom for T-Mobile and Slovak Telekom. So here I think there's the benefit of the partnership uh, where it's better to work together to create a better economy of scale. Yes. And that is, that is the, for us the way forward also for uh, all our other markets, where it makes sense to work together because uh, sports rights costs have usually increased over last time because of the streamers coming in. Exactly. Mm. And and also what we see, of course, that uh, also for the let's say the regular channels, commercial channels, uh, license fees are going through the roof. Um, yes. So that's also where we believe another reason. Say let's work together where we are not competing in in uh, in, in the areas of subscribers or markets. And, and I like that sentence. Let's work together. Yeah. Let's be friends. Yeah. Because the title of the session is. Pricing wars. So, if there is a war, who is fighting against who? <laughs> telcos against telcos, you against the big players. That no, are, who, uh, what is the war between who? Uh, I, I wouldn't we agree. are all fighting for the customer who yes. is watching the content and he is using our platform because we are serving him the, the broadband yeah. and through the broadband the content. So, I think we are fighting for the eyeballs and every a uh, customer who is doing something different than consuming uh, through us, then <laughs> it, it's, uh, this, is the, this is the threat. However, as was said, the aggregation role which we can play is also something where we are benefiting and then we are getting the customer. And these are the, so. here are the bad news. There are also companies, these streamers, aggregating content. So there are companies like Google, like Amazon, also acting as aggregators, or device companies. You mentioned the smart TVs. Samsung, LG, they are yeah. also aggregators of content. So the world is becoming very complicated. You mentioned you have an app on that smart TV. Smart TVs are relevant. Does this mean goodbye set-top box? Or is the set-top box still very important? And why? Bill, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> set-top box or smart TV? <laughs> well, I mean, we, we are, let's say, technology agnostic. Eh? Okay. So we don't care. But I mean, we're very technology advanced, but in the end, we let the consumer decide what is best for them. We don't want to dictate. So we give different options. People can have a set-up box, mm -hmm. can have a basic set-up box, a more advanced set-up box. But where we believe very much in is, is uh, 
a, a non set the box solution. So everything integrated in one app, which we have uh, developed in, in conjunction, in cooperation with the uh, leading uh, TV manufacturers. So this app does not just give you access to all the content, the linear on demand, but also has all the functionalities of a set of box. Mm. So it, uh, it takes away the need for a separate box, the cabling and so on, and it, it, it can maybe also help to prevent privacy, which is yeah. still uh, sort of an issue. So for us, this is a convenient way forward, uh, but we again, we don't want to dictate uh, consumers what they should want, what they should have. So there's still the possibility to get a set of box, but not in all kinds of colors and sizes anymore. Uh, because you know Sky, for example, launched their own TVs, yes, Sky Glass. Yes. Is this what you, you're planning to do I, next as well? <laughs> well, I'm not the product guy here, but, but, yeah. but in, in general, I believe that the set of box will, will be there for a certain time, because um, in the end, if you want to go on the smart TV, you have to control the environment and the ecosystem. And if you are just producing your own app on the smart TV, like on the Samsung or on the, on the LG, then you are an app amongst the other apps. But we as a super aggregator or the best aggregator, we want to control the ecosystem because we want to give our customers a very fluent customer journey from the linear content to the apps they are subscribing to. And that only works if you're controlling the ecosystem in the end. So either we come to agreement with one of the big manufacturers in the end, or and I think this was said in another panel, in another, another conference mm. by our head of TV product, that mm -hmm. we will finally consider at least or discuss internally whether we do our own device. Yeah? So Interesting. Let us know if you mm -hmm. are. As an exclusive, if you, if you <laughs> finally launch... No, that, no, that, that was already mentioned yeah, yeah. in another, another yeah. conference. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. But this is, of course, not yet on the horizon. Uh, but in the end, um, we, we, should, mm -hmm. we have to think about that. And you as well, Anna. I am some, I'm also a believer into the set of box. Maybe the set of box can have other functionalities to, mm. let's say, a bit, be a little bit modern. But it's true, you are controlling the environment. This is important. Even the, the aggregator story could be done better in the set of box because uh, you are deep linking the content. And for us, it's a, a key pillar. If we do some cooperation, then the content, uh, content has to be ingested in a very proper way for the customer to see it. Uh, through the perfect UX UI experience. And uh, so I think that sustainability ap uh, approach, it's nice, fine, but still the, the hardware has the logic why it should be. And the SkyGlass is absolutely great example of that customer is getting something mm -hmm. very sexy, let's say, something what is bringing extra value. On the other end, it's very well serving to the, to the uh, telco player. And going back to the pricing and pricing strategy, how do you keep your customers? I know there is a lot of free content available. We speak out about fast. We will discuss that, of course. It's kind of a must ask question. But before we start with fast and all the free content available, do we believe that Netflix has been guilty of creating the idea of for a very low monthly fee, watch anything you want, and now many streamers cannot pay the productions, the content they have, because it's not sustainable. And now there's a big crisis in all the studios as well with this model that is too cheap for all the content offered. What is your pricing strategy? Are your customers demanding to pay less and less and less? What is the answer, Peter? Good question. I mean, I'm not doing the pricing for, for DT Europe, but, but I would say in general, of course, if you want to bundle in the, uh, the big streamers and you want to offer your customers like an advantage, it's on the one at the customer experience, of course, being very convenient with all the billing integration and everything. But on the other hand, I'm sure that you need to also give a price advantage to the customer yeah? so that the entire bundle is, of course, cheaper than the different parts. Um, accumulated so um but there's of course always again the part with the mobile and the broadband so there's another so the proposition pricing i think is something which is very very difficult and there's uh, a lot of very smart people at dt are working on that so <laughs> and i think you are trying different models like in some countries maybe the swappable like uh, pay for three services each month that you can change is that something you are doing in any of your markets We but, are allowing to, to subscribe to different packages, of course, to, to, but not to this SVOD uh, packages. It's a standard, I don't know, yeah. um, add-ons we, we have because we feel that it's important to give the customer some kind of a flexibility. But on the other hand, people don't like too much to have more, a lot of flexibility. So there's... But, that, but that's, a, that's a very important point, I think. And, yeah. and um, 
I've seen it on another conference that, for example, in Denmark, there's an operator called UC. And what they're doing is you have different packages, you get different points. And from these points, you can like, subscribe to channels and to, to OTT players. And that makes it, of course, very flexible for the customer in the end, what the content he wants to consume, that he pays only for what he wants to consume. Of course, then you have to have the right content partners who are agreeing on these models. Yeah? Uh, but, but I think this is a very flexible and very customer-friendly way to do it. Yeah. Bill, you may say that yeah. quality has a price. <laughs> yes. No, it is. I think it's, it's, it's about explaining the, the customer in it, that they understand what they pay for. Uh, especially if you offer also uh, premium content on top of the, let's say, the basics. And, but then, the, of course, the, the, the smart solution is to bundle it. So to bundle the, let's say, the premium part with uh, the existing pay TV offering. And that's also exactly what we are doing. Um, um, I think that's also the way forward. And I think for the, let's say to put it in a broader context where the streamers are, uh, of course, suffering to, uh, to keep their prices and to, uh, to invest in new content, uh, that's, I think that's what we only see more in the coming years and more consolidation. At least I think all of us uh, have the advantage, both telcos and pay TV operators, that we at least can work from a steady base with customers who, which have a certain loyalty and will not run away for the next offer, uh, like you see in the streamers world. Yeah. That's because that's really, really tricky. Um, so therefore, uh, keep on repeating that I think that uh, the, the bundling, the, the, the basic pay TV, which is still, uh, as you saw in your slides, uh, that's still uh, what the majority of the subscribers uh, want. Yeah? But they want something extra on top. So that's, that's what you have to uh, work out. And are you worried about the rise of this topic, fast, free, free advertising, linear channels. Are you concerned? Is this keeping you awake? Or would you aggregate them as well? Are you planning to launch it together uh, with your premium uh, high-pay product, mm. a collection of fast channels? What is your view about fast? Hype, reality, you are, is in your business plan? I think it depends market to, to market. For example, Czech Republic, definitely it's not uh, the right time to because FAST is still driven from adverts, so you need to have the scale to, <laughs> to deliver FAST channels. However, I think that maybe for some um, uh, bundles where you need to deliver the relevant pricing, then maybe it could be, let's say, as a trigger to, to, to get customers more involved and or also it's copying some kind of a passive way how to discover the content because they are more thematically oriented. So, so this is a kind of YouTube consumption. Could be nice for people, but definitely uh, still our market it's is not, not really ready. something that mm. is worrying you or your priority no, at all. No. What about for Deutsche Telekom in your markets? I think that fa I think you showed some figures on Monday on yes. fast in, in CE region. And it's still quite low. If you compare that actually to, to the US, yes. it's like this. Yes. Uh, so it's it's 0. Really, 0. Really, 0. 0. really peanuts yeah. in the end. I, I believe that given that these markets are very small, very fragmented, and, uh, and all the, the languages are very unique in each market, I think it will take some time until fast comes to CE region and also to our territories. Mm -hmm. I believe that the rise of AI when it comes to maybe localization, that makes localization faster, 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 <laughs> and, faster and cheaper, yeah. that might have an impact on the rollout of fast <coughs> in our region. And in general, when, when it comes, it's good. I mean, when it comes, I see this as a thing for three topics, actually. One is, um, it's a new revenue stream, advertisement. The second is, you can put that outside of your paywall and use it as an upsell tool to pay TV. And the third um, would be that it could be a replacement for all these long-tail international thematic channels, uh, use fast channels for this, also a cost-cutting aspect. I think, I think it's positive. Yeah? So if it comes, it's, it's good. It's positive. If, but if it's it comes, good. it's good. But, but um, I doubt that it will come in the very near future to the CE region. Yeah. What, Bill, what did yeah, you no, I, I, I can only agree. We, we, we discussed it. So it's, uh, it could be a kind of replacement for the long tail channels, uh, especially when you have to put them or keep them on satellite. And yeah. for a small audience, then it's not so cost efficient. Of course. And maybe this could be the way to, to, to get that long tail uh, resolved in another way. And as long as you can easily integrate uh, the fast offering in the overall uh, EPG. And it could also be potentially uh, help to cross-promote pay TV in a kind of Barker channel format. And what was also interesting, uh, there was a presentation from SPI, from another Calapuz company. They, they, they also they have an interesting product called Smart Channels. 
So where you can create, let's say, more personalized uh, uh, versions of the film box channels, and which can be further advanced uh, through uh, AI as well on the, on the long term. So that this, and that can also then, if it's if it can be monetized uh, well enough, then yeah, you can turn it into a fast channel. So do you think because? Although you see it's not a problem, you're not worried, uh, here is still small. Do you think that the, the fact that we're talking a lot about free, 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 and there are so many pay streaming services, piracy has increased as a result, especially also in the sports world. Because if you want to watch different contents, you have to subscribe to, to your services, to the streamers, to so many companies. Are you concerned that piracy is increasing as a result of this fragmentation of where to find the content. It's a super big problem. I mean, if you take the Greek market, for example, we believe that in the Greek market we have 500,000 illegal set-top boxes you know, covering 20,000 channels. And when I talk about saying illegal set-top boxes, it's not about illegal smart cards with a very low resolution. or uh, uh, It's about set-top boxes in 4K, HD, whatever, with customer care behind that, actually. The people buy like 50, uh, pay 50 euros per year, and they believe they have a legal product. Uh, and it's, it's uh, immaculate, and this is really a big problem, and we hope that legislation will improve in Greece, and this is going to be... It's increasing, Peter. Have you seen the last months in going... I wouldn't group? say the last months, but I think the Greek team uh, is very aware of that, that this is really increasing over the years. And, um, of course, the fragmentation of content, the fragmentation of sports rights, for example, and the increasing number of, of different services, uh, and all that on these illegal platforms, of mm. course, is a... Good incentivation to do that. I think you all mentioned this, and I think I may agree, or my view is content is no longer king, it's more king discovering the content. Because many times people cannot find the content they want to watch. They don't even know it's available in a legal way. They find it easier illegally. What will be the role? Is content still king? Is discovering that content, especially with all these thousands and thousands of free channels, what will be the role of AI play? Is AI something you are, will benefit, help you? Are you worried? I mean, I know some operators in Middle East, Sahid announced they have like a generative AI application to find content. You can chat with, <laughs> I want to watch a TV series, less than the three episodes with the Spanish characters. <laughs> are you using already or do you have AI as a way to go forward? Personally, I'm still typing something to JGPT, but on the other <laughs> hand, uh, I, I never, never heard this story about the content uh, um, uh, discovering through this. Interesting. I, I, I more believe that this can be because it can search through the content, content libraries you have available. It can create a new content from the content you have, but is served in a special way, which will take thousands of hours to, to go through your archive and, and build it up somehow. And, and let's say stick it together, I don't know, the, the best goals or I don't know, the best moments of some actor. But uh, this is something where I see the, the future because you can create another content, for example, for social media, where you can attract new, new uh, young audience, which, you know, they're consum consuming mm -hmm. content and they have a social media and they are on a Snapchat with some other uh, person. So, yeah, I, would, I think it's opportunity. However, for the for the piracy, I'm not very sure about that. <laughs> but of course, we are protecting the the content we have again for piracy, and it's I, a huge topic. But yes, yeah. it, it, yes. I, I, I think the AI development is like the internet. It was like 20, 30 years ago or 40 years ago. So um, I think it will have a huge impact on everything. And when it comes to customer experience, I believe that the customer or the recommendation engines will develop in a way that you can only that you can yourself can feed the recommendation engine in the future with your own personal data. So not only with your usage or con content consumption history, but also with what are your personal flavors? What are your personal habits? What are you, where are you going for traveling? What are you consuming privately? What are your social beliefs? I mean, you put everything what you want, not what you don't have to, but what you want, you put that into the engine. And I think then you have a fantastic recommendation in the end. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for this. So you're very optimistic. Not, I'm, about I'm rather optimistic. Very. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think in the production, in the creativity? Would you create premium content using more and more AI? What is the role of AI uh, 
for M7 or for what is your personal view about the impact? Yeah, no, I think I, I can only agree with what is said. It can help to uh, to make the, the the content offering more personalized, based indeed on on uh, uh, more specific recommendations and 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 um, yeah. So that that in that respect, it can uh, it can certainly serve a role to make the offer in the end uh, more attractive and. And the example I mentioned, uh, which was presented by SPI, is, is, is already a first step in that direction where you can, in the end, um, make different variations on existing uh, premium channels and make them more, let's say, personalized and localized uh, according create to the taste Create a fast channel even for you. You can <laughs> even create a fast channel with an AI solution yeah. to promote yeah. the sure. premium. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the applications in are endless. Infinite opportunities, really. Yeah. So... Another topic very important uh, on Monday, if you were here, is social media, social video, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, mm -hmm. and others. How important is for you to use these tools to grab the attention of young audiences? When we speak about telcos, we speak the users to be above 45. Is this true? How mm -hmm. will you attract 18-year-olds to subscribe to Deutsche Telekom, to O2? Mm -hmm. We know that the customers are getting older. Uh, first is of offering the opportunity also to bring some product for this older generation, but this was not the question. So uh, I think that uh, O2 Czech uh, was the first one who had his present on a, on a presence on a TikTok. Uh, so, and there was a lot of heated discussion after all if we should be still presented or, or not. Somehow we, we found out uh, that that it is attracting younger audience and yeah, it has some, some reason to be there. You know? Same for Deutsche Telekom. Yeah. I think it's a marketing tool in the end, yeah. So I'm not aware of the activities of our opcos when it comes to, to uh, social media and TikTok in particular, but, but we are using it definitely. I know from the German colleagues they are using it heavily, like also leveraging existing partnerships like with Bayern Munich in Germany uh, to, to p produce social media, to produce social content. Uh, they are collaborating with uh, creators on TikTok. So I think this is heavily being used currently already. Um, but it's a marketing tool. It's not, at least from my perspective now, it's not, not content for the platform. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's all been said again. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is a marketing tool. That's what it is. And, and same like I think we've... Uh, the colleagues, I uh, mean, the, uh, the pay TV providers uh, tend to be a bit older, <laughs> <laughs> maybe less sensitive for social media. But if you want to attract new audience, especially for uh, asphalt platforms, for premium services, sports channels, uh, yeah, then of course it's a very uh, important instrument uh, as part of the marketing mix. And I, I want now to hear from you if you have to pitch to the audience, if there are streamers here, and I'm asking you all. What is the incremental value you can give as a partner to streaming services uh, that they want to go into markets? <laughs> what can you offer to them? Why do you think they should partner with you? You just saw the figures, yeah? So yeah. obviously they're very important. Oh, so I already did the yeah? job for you. So, you don't need to I mean, persuade the, them anymore. The figures so now we say, will the, be say, it, say it all, yeah? Um, <laughs> no, no, but I, be, I believe that the big streamers are very good in, in skimming easy demographics in a certain market. Yeah, So if they go to a market, they are very good in, in attracting like people who are very as what savvy or as what um, uh, they, they like to do it. Um, I believe that a telco is um, through all its digital touch points with their customer base. Yeah, we're having so I think we are able to to connect them with more difficult demographics uh, and also um, if we come to partnering agreements, I think we give them a very reliable customer base, meaning that, that they have long-term contracts, that uh, you have less churn, you have longer contracts. I think we give longer a certain... Longer contracts we, and... Yes, we give a certain value. The churn is lower if they partner. Yeah. Is, that, is that the case in, with you? If they go with you, the, the churn is lower than going there? Definitely. Uh, less, lower fast. Churn, <laughs> less fast. Lower churn. Less <laughs> fast. Uh, Speaking about fast. We, we own, the, own the customers, so we have the direct... Uh, relationship with the customer we have the base where we can address we, you know so so you we have from where to take you know so yeah. so definitely and uh, you can see that the lifetime of the customer on a on let's say doesn't matter if it's even soft bundled it's it's uh, the trend of seasonality is not there so definitely how many of you are partnering with satelco 
Oh, nobody's <laughs> partnering with Telcos here, okay? Nobody here. <laughs> Partner, <laughs> partnering with Pay TV. No, no, but we but are here, to, but, but are waiting for this. this <laughs> other page so of maybe us. they will yeah, come out yeah. of this. <laughs> but maybe but one example, maybe, um, for example, that DT has a customer self care app called One App. Uh, and with that, a lot of customers, I think 60%, are already managing their accounts with that app. It's very easy for us to, to, to target customers with promotions yeah. and everything on, on, the, on that way. Uh, that's something mm. that the D2C people cannot do. Bill, do you yeah. have partners? And now, difficult question for you, and now be honest. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you are partnering with Telcos, but you're also partnering with device companies. You mentioned partnerships with Apple and other devices. Yeah. Who is easier to deal with? Who is more challenging? What are the benefits to work with telcos, the challenges as well? What is the difference dealing with the device people and the telco people? Ah. Oh, look, they're worried now about your answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, speak to start with the telcos. I mean, as explained, this is, I think it's a win-win for, for, for all of us, especially when it comes to investment in premium content, acquiring sports rights, of course, you can all do it for yourself, and, and, uh, but then in the end, it will not work. It's not viable. And, and, and same for telcos to do it individually. So your partnerships makes, makes full sense, because otherwise the streamers may run away with, uh, with it, but they will also then uh, collapse, I guess, at a certain point. So, so here there is uh, a real benefit for both. Um, with the, um, the hardware manufacturers, uh, that's, of course, critical to, to give best possible access to the content in, in all the possible ways, from the big screen to the mobile devices, but then also in a seamless way. Yeah? It's, not just, uh, it's not just technology, it has to work, it has to be for the consumer in an easy way, so that you start watching on the main screen and you, you move to another place and you want to continue your mobile device, that it really works, that you have this seamless experience. Do you get more data when you partner with these people, the telcos, than when you partner with the hardware companies, or the set of revenues and the partnerships are similar? Well, with the, the, the hardware uh, providers, it's not really, uh, it's more, also more a partnership. It's not that we are earn on that. It's, it's also, in the end, for the, um, the manufacturers, it's a benefit because it makes the, their, their hardware more valuable because they can uh, give their um, customers access to more content, to more exciting content and just, uh, I would say, fast uh, platforms. <laughs> so it's, it's also here, it's, uh, it's a partnership but that works both ways. Fantastic. We have exactly three minutes to close this 10th anniversary event and probably the session at NEM Dubrovnik. Your prediction in one minute for the next 10 years, <laughs> in one minute only, what will be the hottest topic ever? We don't know yet. No. Okay. That's <laughs> it comes in five deal, years. The deal linear TV will be still, let's say, alive. Linear TV will still yeah. be very powerful in 10 yes. years' time. Yes, and the telco is the, is the, is the future for the And the telco will, will be the future. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> what is your prediction in 10 years' time? Will I, everything I be run by computers, robots, and there will no, be very but, little humans? But if you say linear is still there, I believe that local linear is still there. But I don't believe in international long-tail linear anymore. This is all going digital. So I believe, but, but AI will have a big impact, as I said earlier. So I believe that AI will really touch every element of the value chain, and, and this will AI yeah. will be the big thing. Yes. Yeah, so I also I believe linear will still there be to stay, at least for the coming years. It will become, of course, less and less relevant the more uh, asphalt content there will be. Um, but yeah, I think the, the problem will probably be in the streamers world. Eh? There will uh, be more consolidation coming up. And I think that at a certain point they will realize they cannot uh, act on their own. So they also need to, to uh, reach out to, uh, to partners to, to help them maintaining their subscriber base. And, uh, and again, I think that's in the end uh, the best for all, including the, uh, the end user. Fantastic. We just finished on time. Now, if you want these people to be your friends, because you really like what they said and they look really lovely, Meet them, they will come through those stairs. So <laughs> if you want a partnership with them, they are, they are ready here for you. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.